Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're tuning in from. Thank you for joining uh, and let's take a deep dive in immersive learning for safety and soft skills. Uh, and I hope you're here because maybe you're an HR leader or you're coming from safety or uh, from an operational perspective. But when you look at kind of your current training and learning methods um, and toolbox, you think there must be a better way or maybe there's something missing, right? So whether you're thinking, okay, um, uh, I have classroom, I have e-learning, but is there something else? There must be a, b a better way. Maybe you've experienced VR already in a learning and training environment, but it's very focused on 3D and you think this could be more realistic. There could be, uh, there might be a better way. Or maybe you've experience with creating VR scenarios, um, uh, but you're using a lot of tools and you basically need a better workflow. Whatever it is, um, I think we're gonna have a great webinar to show you what can be done um, and hopefully can guide you and navigate, help navigating you in this space. My name is Guido Helmhorst. I'm one of the co-founders of Warp VR. And for the past six years, we've been helping more than 25 companies, mid-size, but also enterprise, in, in kind of helping and answering their questions around training their workforce in a more scalable and immersive and a more realistic way. Right, so um, before that, I spent almost 10 years at KLM where I saw hands-on the, um, the challenge of situational training, on-the-job training for large groups of people in an operational environment like an airline is. Um, but now with Warp, we're uh, showing and we've been helping more than 25,000 people already in immersive learning scenarios and that can be around safety scenarios can be around soft skills can be for onboarding and across industries right so retail banking healthcare you name it because in the core it's all about putting people in situations where they can learn by doing and experiencing consequences um, and you see that also in the data in the research right so for example when we talk about confidence the, uh, the, how, how more confident people will be after doing such training scenarios, uh, study shows 25% or more, which means real business results because uh, people are better prepared for the situations uh, they are facing or will be facing uh, in their working environment. And if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them in in the chat um, and we will be happy to answer them uh, when we can. Um, so today the setup is we're going to talk about your challenges or at least discuss some of the challenges you might also be facing. Um, I hope to guide you and navigate you a little bit in that immersive, uh, uh, immersive space and how to connect that to your challenges. Um, and to provide you some tools along the way uh, to help you on your journey. But luckily, I'm not alone. I'm here alone, but I've uh, interviewed two amazing experts and I will be using their input, their video along the way to support the story and to help you also understand how they solved their challenges and how they're using immersive learning. So first, is Aiden in Tasman, and he ch he is an HSC uh, learning training manager within Shell Brunei. Uh, the other one is Nick Brashier uh, from EDF, and he's a learning innovation lead, uh, and he also has some great stories to share with us. So let's talk about the challenges you might face, and I'm just going to take out a few which. You know, we've come across in, in the past months, weeks, uh, years, um, just to kind of show and share with you what, what is happening and that you're probably not alone in those challenges. 
Um, and, and basically, there are kind of two labels or two categories, right? So there's one is more about the external challenges you and you as a company or your company might, f- uh, might face um, uh, because of the context you're operating in or because of bigger trends that are happening in the world. Uh, and the other one is the internal uh, kind of uh, category, which is more directed um, towards the organization itself. So let's start with the first one, right? So external. So let's say maybe um, you are experiencing uh, that a lot of people in your organization are actually quitting. They're resigning, right? They say, okay, you know, I'm going to stop working here. I'm going to join another company. And you, you started to notice kind of a pattern in when you ask, you say, why are you leaving? So, and it turns out it was all about, or a part of it is about unsympathetic leaders or un- unsympathetic leadership. Um, and then, of course, the question for you as a company is, okay, so how are we going to address that? How are we going to provide empathy training? Um, considering the great resignation, considering that you have to, uh, reskill and upskill your uh, your employees uh, in order to re- retain them as much as possible. Um, so, how do you go about, and how do you then look at uh, the 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 availability of methods you have, classroom, e-learning? But again, you might say, "Hey, what what else is out there?" Another challenge uh, you might face is that there is a new asset arriving. Right, you have a um, uh, heavy, uh, heavy asset um, uh, company operation, like an airplane or a train or or an oven, uh, uh, whatever it may be, um, and a new version is arriving. But how are you going to train and show and familiarize your employees with that new assets? Right. So, are you going to bring them all to a certain place? In, uh, uh, in your organization or at a, at a certain place in, in your country where they have to travel to, or is there another way? Another challenge you might have is, okay, so I'm, I have to onboard a lot of people a month. 50, 100, I don't know the number, but it could be that you have to onboard them month after month again, and you have to show them certain procedures in certain facilities um, uh, and that takes up a lot of energy and a lot of resources to actually train them on location and then again the question is isn't there another way all right so getting into more the internal challenges you might face maybe you have an l d team who you want to upskill and provide with a bigger toolbox because you want to create more engaging content and more fresh content because you want to really engage your employees. Um, And you're looking at your content in your current LMS and you think, hey, this is all about knowledge. This is all about uh, uh, knowing things, but not necessarily about the practical application. Or... um, uh, you are you have a classroom or you, you, you use classrooms and trainers a lot. And how uh, do you engage your trainers who have been doing this for the past 20 years to actually modernize, to make it more fresh, to make it more sticky? Or maybe within your company, people are already, or a department uh, is already using VR training. Uh, maybe in, let's say, the safety department. But you as HR want to experiment, want to try out um, uh, more for soft skills, right? Or vice versa. Um, And studies show that you're not alone. Around 80% of the C-suite sees L&D as a priority, but also sees that L&D is lagging in their efforts to make actually an impact. Another statistic is around 85% of employees believe they need new skills, right? And they don't want to uh, be left behind, but how are they actually going to 
get those new skills. So another statistic is around 90% of the companies think existing training methods are, not, are just not cutting it, right? So they're also missing impact. So what this boils down to is that it's about speed, right? Speed of development, speed of distribution, speed of how quickly people can actually uh, experience and learn from uh, uh, the content you provide. It's about um, uh, uh, distribution of the disp dispersion of where your people are. Are, there, uh, are they central or are they multinational? It's about sustainability. Uh, are you trying to reduce maybe flying times or, or travel uh, moments? It's about modernization, right? So providing users with a user experience that is consumer graded. Um, and those are all about kind of that return on investment on, okay, I have a challenge, what can we do? Now let's bring Aiden in and Nick in, um, uh, where they will share their story on their challenges. So first, Aiden in, on how they were struggling and trying to um, uh, solve the challenge they had around a 90-year-old training facility and trying to digitize that. And Nick will share with us more around the challenge uh, of bringing innovation into the EDF organization. So when I came 2020, there was nothing at all, right? 2021, we started to think about digitalization. No, right now, before that, even the attendance were handwritten in papers and all that. So we started digital digital attendance, you know, scanning QR code, putting your name in your phone, and then that's it, you know, easy. Then we, pandemic, uh, the COVID start, uh, struck again in Brunei. It was, I, if I'm not mistaken, it was August, something like that. Huh? I couldn't even remember the dates. <laughs> but somewhere, somewhere uh, 2021, uh, second wave came in. We were not prepared. Yeah, to be honest, we were not prepared at all. Okay. And, you know, at the end of the end of the year, we normally send out a report to the government just to make sure that all our staff are competent. And we are struggling, right? We were struggling how to how to get this thing this training running you know get them certified and all that then we started ms teams you know just just uh having a training via ms team or in in our case is google right so they are we are just using any online platform that is available right uh then we were stuck we were stuck again because the work management procedure training requires you to actually identify hazard, which you can't actually do it via online. You know, it's just a picture, and pictures are blurry at some point. You can't even scroll in and out. <laughs> there's no, there's no, um, there's no movable, uh, movable. I would say movable images. And uh, we were talking to Shell, uh, uh, since we are a JV for Shell. Guys, what do you have? over there that you know can help us making sure that this this could be a related reality we, we talked to the wells community because they do have that uh the vr technology in brunei already at that time uh so i don't need to mention the the brand but it was a different brand all right yeah. but nonetheless we thought that that would be a good start okay however when we look at the 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 requirements and the things that that we need to do it doesn't seem that we could be upskilling our own self because all of it is done by the vendor it's just a pay you do it they do it they come back this is your product but in my mind i just want to make i want i just want to upskill my team as well you no know? we want them to to you know have that competent build up as I said, told you before, they started off with zero multimedia skill, zero filming skill for mobile phone camera or video. That's fine, no? but for educational video photography, no, they have they haven't got anything. And 
I'm I'm proud that I can say right now they can they can do it, right? They can they can start from pre-production, you know, during the project and post-production are being done well. Yes, there are some enhancement that we needs to be do uh, needs to be done, uh, and we'll work it out. We will work it out. That's for sure. So I think for us, it's understanding skills. That seems to be a, you know a key driver at the moment. Is actually how can we utilize our individual skills from across the organization to kind of help learn, grow, and develop, but also kind of fill gaps that again skill shortage may you know the great I think is a great resignation. You know people are leaving and they're coming and going. So how can we identify people's skills? And as part of that, I think for us, it's doing things differently. You know, I, I've worked within learning and develop now for what twelve years. And, you know, we've gone from face to face training, which was, you know, very much this for good three or four years. Then it's gone e-learning, which, again, probably like four or five years. And then that question mark around my role is actually what can we do differently? Because that we're not getting the uptake as what we did within e-learning. So it's kind of that's the problem that we have is skills and how can we make something new, interesting, exciting for people to click, watch, learn and understand what they can do within their roles. So that's some of the challenges that we're finding at the moment. Yeah, no, I think it's a, for me, it's a combination of the two. It's almost kind of two, two, two roads meeting at a crossroads. So you've got that innovation, that learning, which is kind of always happening. So it's always that constant. And it's um, the other kind of business driver from it is, as you said, this impact, you know, cost, um, but it's also talent. So that's kind of a key element as well. It's kind of talent, future talent. How can we kind of prepare our future leaders, our leaders in, in their role and and what do they do and i think quite often you know gone are the days where you sit a leader down in front of a, a week's long training course and you know that's you that's you're a leader now it's not and i think what we've started to see as an organization actually it's around our people so how can we support our people which is that underlying factor and i think for us that's where their crossroad comes in it's without our people People won't learn, people won't drive the business, people won't then become managers. So we've started to kind of really strip it back and just say, actually, how can we support our people as one of the main business drivers? And it then yeah. that supports pretty much every <laughs> every column within the organization, doesn't it? Yeah. So. so work in the working environment is changing. A lot is happening. Um, and in a way, it can be a bit paralyzing, right? Such so much is happening. How do we navigate? What uh, what do we do in a way? Um, but but that paralyzation almost uh, reminded me of of um, uh, the seven most expensive words in business I recently heard, and that is, this is how we have always done it, right? And that goes for business, that goes for training. So then the question is, what can we do? Well, the answer is innovation, but I think the core of the answer is prototyping, starting, doing it. There is a lot happening, right, in the world of, let's say, immersive tech, the metaverse, eh, Facebook getting uh, or, or renaming, rebranding into meta, new hardware, new headsets, the PS5 VR, um, uh, but also new learning management systems with more user experiences and, and even using artificial intelligence to provide content. It's about learning record stores and, and therefore performance data. So there is a lot of happening. And the trick, of course, is, is how do you navigate? Right? And, and, and I think... And what we've seen in, in the applications we've, uh, we've seen also with our clients is that we, you have to be able to look at your challenge and everything that is available and make that connection. Connect the dots on, hey, this is my, um, uh, this is my challenge. These are the parameters. This is what my organization needs right now. And this is what happening. This is what is happening. And, and, I can make those steps, but it's always small steps, right? There is no big leap to be made here. Make the small steps, um, make sure you prototype, make sure you start um, 
And in the end, that will result in you closing the gap between knowledge and practice. Right? Making situations, making on-the-job training um, a digital reality. And then from there, making that digital experience a more human experience. And we're now going to listen to Nick and Adenin talking about how they see kind of the future they are going towards and a little bit of the journey they have been taking going there. For, for me, certainly within my role, it's utilizing a varying degree of technologies. So, you know, whether that's virtual reality, um, whether that's 360, whether that's AI-assisted learning, AI-assisted chatbots, um, augmented reality, for example, is another one. And then, you know, you put all those in a melting pot and somebody might call that the metaverse. So I think, you know, ultimately it's that journey to, to you know, this great horizon that we keep hearing about, but we're not quite sure what that's consisted of. And at first, that's our journey. That's what we need to do is we need to work on these technologies maybe individually. And then as the technology kind of progresses and as we start to kind of go from that maturity aspect, we start then bring them in and they start working together, working collectively. And that's our journey. That's my role. You know, that's what we're exploring now at this moment in time. So you know, Guido, I'm 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 pretty much new in this uh, faculty, right? So two years, of, yeah, almost two years. Yeah. But my team member have been here for almost ten years or more. All right. Some have been started the career in this faculty. In and out is the same thing. I will just go to the class, do my thing, you know, mark the papers, put it in the system. Imagine 10 years doing the same thing. The excitement, you know, the motivation to go to work is quite low, right? But when we introduce excitement, new things, you know, I can see they actually came early, earlier than me in the office. So <laughs> that is a positive feedback, right? You know, yeah. And I was asking, why are you guys so early? Oh, we need to set up the camera. We need to talk to these people. <laughs> So that encourage them to do their own networking. They do they do their own collaboration with the project projecting outside, you know, because we also landed, uh, we also went to someone's site to do filming, and they did it. You no, know? I do not have to even teach them how to to do networking, you know. That's so so cool. yeah, yeah. you see the difference there. You see yeah. how the motivation just suddenly rise up, you know, and coming from this used to be i have to say uh, a, a bit boring and dull no facial impression to to a smiley face every day so that's that's what, I, what I'm, I'm proud of as well you know so how do you go about solving the challenges you have um and i want to dive a little bit more uh, into that and I think it's helpful to, to, to look at that uh, on three levels. First is strategic, then tactical, and then operational. All right, so, okay, so the first is strategic, or let's start with uh, strategic. That's all about your management, right? The C level, higher management. Are they open to innovation? Are they open to new ways to solve their business challenges? Are they open to receive information on research, more and more research coming out on those confidence levels we, uh, I talked about, on more engagement than classroom. Um, are they open to receive use cases? Um, but in the end, I think one of the most important parts is, and that we will uh, hear that later also on from Nick, is that are they open to actually experience those immersive learning experiences themselves right so then we get to the next level which is tactical let's say middle management right because they those are the ones often who have the real pain and hopefully also have the budget so talk to them show them there's more than classroom there's more than e-learning and that a natural evolution um, uh, is happening, which uh, moves towards immersive learning. 
um, uh, show them the benefits, show them the business cases. Um, uh, that is incredibly important, which brings us to the third level, and that's operational. Um, and that ties it back into prototyping. You have to create your own pilots. You have to create your own experiences because it will be in your context. It will be around your challenges. It will showcase your employees if they want to uh, act uh, and be part of uh, uh, the experience. Um, and that ties then back into the other levels, right? Because then if you have that, you can show them on a strategic level on, uh, to your management, to show you, uh, to, ma to your uh, middle management. Um, so for me, I would say that operation, that, that let, let's make something, let's create something which is valuable for you and your organization, that's the foundation. And then the question is, do I go to middle management or do I go to higher management? Um, uh, and actually, Nick has some really interesting insights on that. So listen, let's listen to that. So I think, I suppose for us, it's been quite interesting, the journey in itself. We, we tend to be relatively early adopters in quite a lot of technology. So to go away from that e-learning Oh, almost kind of trend that was really happening kind of three or four years ago we started to look at vr you know vr when you're still connected to laptops you needed to game in vr and you had all your sensors all around your room and we had some really good use cases some fantastic but we when we looked at that we realized the scalability of the technology wasn't quite there so yeah we could only really have that out in one place we then realized that actually kind of like MOOCs were, were really important so we kind of then looked at you know video editing software and how can we rapidly create you know these these massive online open courses and then we're kind of steer in shape of putting the feelers out into the industry and saying oh actually there's an oculus quest one that's going to be released so what does that look like okay that cost is coming down so we then realized that, okay vr is more viable but then when we bring vr headsets in not everyone gets on with it not everyone kind of get you know not everyone likes it it's quite expensive still to develop the software and through these journeys it's almost shaping that room because what we then find out is actually great in some instances but in the scalability is an element around there so i then took the thing i then took the view of okay what's immersive but what could also be relatively chopped cost effective so i then looked at 360 a couple of years ago you know i'm into gopro and mountain biking and at that point, they just released the GoPro Max. So I was like, right, okay. So we've gone from you know these big tethered VR headsets to kind of wireless, now Oculus 2 to 360 cameras, which gone are the days where they're huge, um, you know, on a tripod. And just started to look at that. And that's when I then got challenged by my senior leaders to say, Nick, it's great creating a 360 video, but where's the learning aspect? You know, where can we then extract that data? Where can we then test people's knowledge? Where can we put kind of hints and tips and guides within there? And that's the journey that we're going to now. That's what we're on, you know, speaking to what VR. Coincide that with my colleagues then working on chatbots and AI. So you can start to see all of these work streams coming together. And again, almost that funneling shape, isn't it? To actually, this is the art of the possible. This is what we can do. This is how much it costs. This is how people access it. So that's kind of our journey from where it's been to now and into the future is enabling people to use it. And I think that's the key thing. Um, I remember a few years ago saying, you know, VR headsets, we don't want it to be exclusive. We want it for the masses. And I was then challenged by my um, senior leadership team within HR to say, think about the rollout. How do you make it accessible for all? And that's why that kind of natural um, 360 access to chatbots, et cetera, have really come into play. And that's what we're still heading towards in the future. We used the, the we used a blend of both, really. So we used research and we then wanted to build, well, again, quite common, quite common knowledge in terms of rapid prototyping to say, actually, this is what it could look like. So with that research and with the rapid prototyping of a business problem that we knew we needed to solve but we weren't sure of the solution you know such as 360 warp vr we kind of created something which 
people could go into get the look and feel for it but then have that data set as you know say for example pwc and other, and other white papers out there but what we did differently is we didn't target middle management because quite often that's where we failed in the past and i say failed you learn from your mistakes so quite often what we do is we'll go into a specific level of the business where you'd have really high engagement i think this could work really well within our area but i don't know i don't hold the budget so i have to go up and then that middle management having a discussion with their senior leadership team they haven't seen it they haven't been on that journey so what we then decided to do is let's go almost straight for the top so one down from our ceo we then said this is the technology that we're looking for this is the showcase this is what we're doing what do you think well you know we got buy in of course we got challenges and we got considerations such as the accessibility and scalability and that's how we approached it and that's how we got the support and that's where the pwc you know data the showcasing of it and targeting the right audience you know that almost golden triangle has really helped us over the last 12 to 18 months bring in a lot of in it yeah bring in a lot of innovation which is nice and we've been building it up over the last kind of two years but we knew that you know during the pandemic we wanted to deliver something kind of really insightful and that's when we made the decision to you know go big or go home it's it's actually let's invest a good chunk of money into an experience send out these vr headsets to senior leaders because you know these are individuals that are you know of the generation don't often don't often gain you know they don't often use vr headsets so if we can get their buy-in actually as you said that trickle down movement should be where you know should be quite very positive and that's where we thought actually why not this time last year present some vr some innovative technology let's have an hour meeting let's have a discussion you've got the tech in your hands what do you think and that's kind of where we got it from so it's been a, you know it's been a long journey you know it's, yeah. you're probably looking at three and a half years from you know talking initially around that wider concept of VR to kind of where we are today, but it's been really the last, as you said, maybe 12 months that we've kind of taken that into a real positive aspect and said, you know, let's do it. Let's really showcase it. Let's use the data. Um, let's use these showcases to say, hey, this is what we can do with some innovative technology. We just connected with them on that people level and just said, look, we'd really inside, we'd be really interested in what your, what, what your feedback is, what your comments are. I think using that data, we could showcase actually any of this technology is here to stay. Um, and the Deloitte Millennial Survey has been really powerful for that because it shows actually what does those younger, you know, millennials, Gen Zs, you know, it breaks down what they're looking for within roles and being able to back that up and say, actually, we're going to have a multitude of generations within an organization with different expectations. We need to get ahead of the curve. And having that data to back it up has been really supportive. But again, their openness to, to try it has been great as well. Exactly. <laughs> That's how Nick approached it. And so basically he said, middle management, uh, we're going to skip that step and we're just going to go straight to the top and try to uh, make it happen there. Um, and of course, that also has to do with the organization EDF is. Now let's listen to Adenin who will share with us what happened when he first showed their f uh, kind of first uh, immersive learning experience to his directors. So the first session that I gone through with the, we call it the safety operation committee. Okay, the SOC we call it, uh, is chaired by the asset director. And, uh, and there's, another, there's another committee which we call it safety leadership forum that is hosted by the, our managing director. So I've been in both sessions. And the first reaction that uh, came about was, can we put this in our BSP bulletin, you know, to share it? Because they were surprised that, oh, now you can actually do it via tablets and you can actually do it, you know, you can film it by yourself. This is fantastic, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and the comment that I got from my first uh, my first engagement with them was, please don't stop at safety. Look into other other departments, other functions, you know, other type of soft skills that you know needs to be embedded. So I guess <laughs> there's more in my plate now, you know. <laughs> but uh, the second session, the second session with my with the managing director was telling them about the progress we have been uh, and what sort of 
potential things that can be brought in into BR. Uh, I, I mentioned about the emergency equation just now. I mentioned about induction. I mentioned about how to deal with uh, difficult clients, uh, how to uh, probably you know, uh, com communicate effectively, things like that. Hmm. And uh, I think I got around 12 lists right now, 12 items on my list. So fully supported. But I did mention to them, please give us time to, you know, to really make the safety ones perfect first. So meaning to say, we try to enhance the video, we try to enhance the audio, yeah. then, then definitely we'll work on the rest of the things. So it's all about the blend, right? Im immersive learning is not the golden egg. It's, it, it's not there to replace, but it's there to fill a gap which is there um, and the reason we're now talking about it is because it is the technology is there right so it's now more easy to create it's now easier to distribute at scale right so the benefits are more to be actually gained right VR has been there for like 20 years. And, and that's also what Nick told me, right? So he said, that we, we experienced in a very, or uh, experimented in a very early stage. But then the technology kind of um, hold us, yeah, held us back because we couldn't scale it, right? We, we still had to go to a classroom, to a certain uh, uh, room where the whole setup was. So it, it was just too damn complicated. And that has changed. Um, but that doesn't mean that classroom or e-learning as we know it has no value anywhere, uh, anymore. And uh, it's, it's, it's about looking at what should happen, uh, what the learning experience should be what the learning goal is. If it's purely knowledge, please uh, look at e-learning or a quiz or whatever uh, 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 is available to, um, uh, to to portray that knowledge in a good way. Or when it's uh, uh, about a classroom or some uh, expert experience, you can also go for a classroom. But also look at the combination. Right. Also look at, hey, I want to make something practical. What is there to make it um, practical and make it true to life? And that's where immersive training comes in. And in the end, it's about you having it in your toolbox in order to provide the perfect blend to your trainees. Right? And that's why we stress the importance of prototyping. Do it. Try it not to immediately uh, be an expert or, or, or scale it through your whole organization, but at least you then know what it can do, what it cannot do, and how it will play and how it can play a role in your uh, offering. Because ultimately, it's about making it fresh for your uh, organization and for your learners, um, uh, and Nick has a uh, has a fantastic comment about that. For me, that that blended approach is is vital. I think that's the you know that is the big tick in the box. Uh, and you know, through kind of some some tests and trials with VR with three hundred and sixty, in its in its own entity, it's great. But again, it's it's quite it is, it's quite intense, isn't it? But what we found is actually building that into a journey where people can talk about it, where they can explore it a bit more, where you go from that virtual world to a physical world, that has the greatest impact. And that's what we found. And, you know, going forward, of course, there'll always be the ability to produce something in its entity, you know, a, a tour of a, of a building, for example, you may not need to talk to people about it, but that in, it, in its own self is, is really good. But if you're talking about emotive subjects, if you're talking about mental health, if you're talking about physical well-being, if you talk about health and safety, that whole blended, blended approach is really, really vital. Um, 
and as you said that's the way that we're looking to kind of go for like going forward not through just general training but also leadership training we really want to have hey here's a vr headset complete modules a b and c we're going to come back together discuss them you're going to go through some e-learning you're going to complete a chatbot you're going to do some 360 video and i think it keeps it fresh i think that's the, that's the thing isn't it it's um and you're also appealing to to different people's ways of learning and i think for me in the past as a trainer you try and encourage that but i think now with the ability with technology you can really do that and just appeal to different people's ways of learning both yeah. internal and external we as warf vr are of course very happy to support you on this journey and for the past uh, six plus years we've been helping companies on that journey on that path um, starting creating prototyping to scaling and uh, uh, full-blown implementations um, but i can tell you what i think warp vr uh, what we are for our customers but let's hear nick and aiden in um, uh, uh, on what they say to their colleagues when they talk about what we do so when i picture myself the the two words that uh, come to my head is adaptable and flexible right when you say adaptable is you can actually you can actually uh, customize it to what you want huh? be it a uh, safety training be it a uh, soft skill training no i've seen your demo you know and when i look at it hey we can do this then i actually I actually talked to one of the the logistic team so i presented the logistic team about what we are this is what they do what do you want what do you want to uh, what do you what do you think that what we are can do for you and the list just keeps on coming oh my god guido i couldn't even stop them so <laughs> i do have i do have some few lists that uh, that is coming to me that we can we can actually do uh, so the flexibility is pretty much it can be as 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 immersive as you want you no know? it all depends on your mind you know? how you how you you create the scenarios what sort of conversation that you you anticipate having you know brunei is a small country the culture is quite different the way that you talk the way that you you know you narrate and the tone of the voice is also different. So if I were to put a white man there talking to a young Bruneian, we would be you know, taken aback. But if you see someone local with the same tone, you'll be a friend. You know? you know? So I would be seeing a friend on, on my screen asking me, can you spot the hazard? <laughs> so yeah, these are the things that came up to my mind, adaptability, flexible not not to not to say the least user friendly because based on the six pilot uh, session that we have everything was was done in like one hour compared to the normal traditional class which is approximately four hours it's the ability to create and take 360 videos and turn it into learning content and then that, that and that in its purest entity is what i use when i talk to senior leaders when i talk to people and and they're like, oh you know what does that mean you know learning content well you, you take this the spherical video where a user can look wherever they need to and you put in directions you put in logic you put in questions and you just bring that environment to life and yeah it's you kind of you just see the penny drop or the light bulb switch on and they kind of like ah okay and it's just a different immersive way to transfer that knowledge you know you mentioned earlier around you know the impact of having that you know immersive learning is much greater 100 percent higher than e-learning than classroom yeah. learning and, and and that's what we say in its purest form you know and having the ability to then use the studio to then edit that to kind of um you know frame it together and to then produce it that people can access on their phones vr tablets etc that's what we always tend to say and as you said you know keep it simple keep it straightforward so that 
you know two or three sentences that i just gave is is what we use to the business and yeah you see people's eyes light up really and then you send them the demo and they're like oh i get it now yep i'm looking around on my phone in this world amazing so you can wait with making it fresh as nick put it all right sure you can wait but now is the time because your competitors are moving in all right and i told you it's about that speed it's about reducing cost and it's about adding it to your toolbox um and when you wait you won't have it in your toolbox and it will take more and more time to actually show the value and to bring it into the methods you use to uh, engage your learners right and to make it interesting for them and to help them grow and to help the company thrive Warp Studio is the all-in-one solution, all-in-one platform that helps you, that allows you to create your own scenarios, to help you distribute, even via your learning management system, to your um, uh, uh, workforce, to your employees. Uh, but also shows you the data on the performance, which then allows you to build on that. Um, it also allows for prototyping right so yes you can build uh, build big um uh, great experiences but our appeal also in this webinar uh, and i hope it made you curious and and kind of anxious to actually get started because that's what you can do right so um i hope in this webinar we showed you um, uh, the challenges and how you could think about solving them with immersive learning and how we with our expertise but also with our platform can play a role uh, in helping you solve those challenges um, I want to think uh, I want to not think I want to thank Aiden and Nick for their um, expertise and, and let's say virtual support uh, which was awesome. Um, and for now, I hope you enjoyed uh, this webinar. Follow us on uh, via our LinkedIn page. More webinars are to come. Also check out previous webinars on, for example, storytelling. Um, uh, great resources. And of course, reach out, connect, and hope to see you soon.